Well, there is much to talk about. Let's go straight to our panel. Joining us here in our studio, William Courtney is an adjunct senior fellow at the RAND Corporation and a former U.S. ambassador to Georgia and Kazakhstan. Also with us on set is Federica Bindi. She's a non-resident scholar with the Europe program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Joining us from London, Alexander Nakrasov is a former advisor to the Kremlin. And Chen 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 joins us from Beijing. She's deputy director at the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at China's Renmin University. Welcome to all of you. And Chen Chen, let me start with you in Beijing. Let's talk about this relationship, a growing relationship, and its significance. China has seen its economic growth slow down, and uh, its business with the United States could also be severely affected by this trade war, uh, which is taking place right now. So the question is, can expanding trade ties with Russia fill in part of the gap which has been caused by this dispute with the United States? Well, I do think if you look at the relationship with Ch between China and Russia, I do think the uh, trade tensions between China and the United States actually now serves as a push for these two countries to work closer. Uh, because when I talk with my colleagues in Moscow, in Russia, actually we come up with a consensus that, for example, uh, Russia is now suffering from the uh, financial sanctions by Washington and China is also having this uh, increase in tariffs imposed by Washington. So uh, now uh, the uh, global institutions, in, in especially the currency system, is centered around uh, US dollar. So in the future, how can you control the financial risks, especially the trade costs? Um, so I do think that this trade tension is serving as the uh, push for uh, the country to work closer, although it's not the only reason, I do. Okay. Alexander, trade between Russia and China reached $100 billion last year, and there are now hopes that it will reach $200 billion in the not-so-distant future. What is the main potential for growth between these two countries? Well, I would say that uh, the trade, uh, $1 billion, is not that great, actually, because if you consider that the trade between China and America is about 624 or 5 billion. That, that shows you the difference. And I, would, I suspect that mostly the growth would be linked to energy, uh, and uh, probably energy, yes. And I think there's a lot, a lot for Russia and China to do there. And uh, to be honest with you, I think at the moment we are looking more at symbolic statements and gestures, uh, like in Moscow and in St. Petersburg, because there is a lot to do for the two countries, considering the situation in the world, considering the growing problems in Western economies, and uh, uh, the, 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 the desire, the, the need, the, the urgent need for Russia and China to protect themselves from this fallout. You know, look at Europe. It's printing money in trillions. And the moment it stopped, it nearly collapsed. Britain has printed so many trillions, and nothing went into the economy. America is talking about how wonderful the stock exchange, the markets are, but the markets are living in a different world. It's a virtual economy. So there are so many problems. And for example, I've been talking to some of the Russian experts, and I said to them, how will you find ways of avoiding all these pitfalls that the West has fallen into. I mean, raising of capital on the markets, is, it's a disaster, absolute disaster, what is going on in the West. And that is why I think the main idea of uh, this closeness between Russia and China right. is to develop a new strategy in this very, very dangerous, unpredictable world. Ambassador, let's bring it to the studio. What do you make of these growing ties between China and Russia? Is it an alliance of convenience, or is there more to it? Well, there's several aspects. Uh, the economic part we've been discussing. Uh, trade between Russia and China, as Alexander points out, is not that great. It's about $100 billion a year. Uh, by comparison, for example, China's trade with the United States is $1 trillion, so 10 times uh, the amount. So there should be a lot more trade. To make a comparison, Canada and the U.S. have about the same GDPs, respectively, as Russia and China. But Canada and the U.S. trade 11 times more than Russia and China do. So Russia and China really should be trading more. That will depend a lot on their economic policy, opening up, uh, opening up opportunities for private enterprise, especially in both those countries, and, of course, energy 
uh, exports. On the political and security side, though, there are concerns in the West about Russia and China's relationship. So in that respect, uh, as Alexander pointed out, that what we're seeing on our television screens may be very symbolic, but is, would they be looking also at some kind of strategic relationship? Uh, from the standpoint of Ma Russia, yeah. yes. Russia is mainly uh, motivated by political and security considerations in trying to stand together with China to show that it's not going to be intimidated by the West by Western sanctions. China, on the other hand, is more focused on the economic side. So China's uh, BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, building infrastructure across Russia and Kazakhstan to Europe, uh, which is one of the three largest markets of the world, that's very much economically focused. And that looks to the long-term strength for China. For Russia, the economy is nearly stagnant. And so they're not going to be able to keep up. Federica, um Europe, of course, has been looking at this meeting that's been taking place in Russia. Uh, the uh, Belgian Deputy Prime Minister, Chris Peters, he said recently that Russia needs to be aware of drifting away from its European neighbors. Is, is there much concern in Europe at this growing relationship? Yeah, there is concern, but uh, I mean, they should have seen it coming. This was coming a few years ago already. And uh, I mean, it started with the Donbass and it's and, and the crisis of gas with Ukraine. But uh, the problem is that you either work with Russia as the European Union or Russia will go east and, and work with China. There is no other way, both for security reasons, as you pointed out, but also for economic reasons. Because uh, when I was in government, even before the crisis took place, so when the relations with Russia were good, it hasn't happened one single time that we, we didn't have the question, when are you going to diversify it? When are you going to stop importing gas from, from Russia? So this was in, in good times, right? So Russia needs a market for its gas and its exports. And if, if Europe is not there anymore, it needs to sell elsewhere. So both reasons, Russia is forced to look at. Alexander, uh, what do you make of what the Belgian Deputy Prime Minister said? Uh, Peters, that's Chris Peters, the, Russia, the Belgian Deputy Prime Minister, he also said that Russia um, doing business with Europe uh, will be, po it'll be a positive act for both Russia and for Europe. The implication, I guess, is that Russia uh, has to make a choice here. It's either us or it's China. Well, I think uh, the problem is, of course, that Europe uh, has itself caused uh, this uh, crisis in relations with Russia because I've been telling you on your program before that once the Ukraine uh, fell into Western hands uh, after that coup, everything changed completely, totally. It's very difficult for Putin to convince the Russian population that the West uh, and Europe can be friends when Ukraine is uh, in this crisis when there is a civil war which is blamed on Russia, and uh, all this um, talk about annexation of Crimea continues, this has to be resolved. Otherwise, nothing will happen. And not forgetting, of course, that NATO is on the borders of Russia, which was unheard of only uh, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, this is all very difficult for Putin to stomach and to, to sell it to the people. So Europe, on the one hand, is saying, well, let's be partners, let's be friends. We just saw how Europe celebrated the 75th anniversary of the Normandy landing. They've invited Merkel of Germany, who was standing between the allies. There was no Russian president, which is absurd. Germany has never apologized to anyone in Europe for destroying and killing their people, and yet it's there. The Russians who lost 25 upwards million uh, fighting fascism and, and, and saving a lot of Europe from it was not there. So what is Europe talking about? Europe is playing this game, you know, let's be friends, and at the same time uh, causing a lot of problems and creating a lot of hostility. It doesn't work like this. Federica? Yeah, no, I, exactly. I just want to point it out. You know, we just had the D-Day celebrations, and we always remember the D-Day and, and the sacrifice of the Western allies, which, of course, we were grateful for, but we always forget about the millions of Russians which actually died fighting uh, Nazism during World War II. And uh, this is completely forgotten. So we, and, and, and also, uh, 
uh, it was mentioned before NATO. Yeah. Uh, when, when NATO expanded, mm. there was an agreement after the first expansion that it wouldn't expand east. And, and the problem came when then President Bush proposed for Georgia and, and Ukraine right. to be on a roadmap. Yeah. And that was read in very two different ways in, in here and, and in Russia. For Russia was a walking back on the word that was given at the time of the, of the first enlargement and as a threat as well. And, and I think so the West, Europe and the US together created this problem. Then I'm not saying the Russians are innocent or everything, but we, we right. need to take our shared responsibilities. All right, Tenshin, let me get back to China. Uh, as Alexander pointed out earlier on, China signed many agreements with Russia during this visit, mainly in the energy sector, gas uh, and, uh, the, I guess, gasoline um, sectors. But there was one other deal which, uh, which stood out, and that was uh, Huawei. You know, this is a company which has now become almost a household name all over the world, Huawei. Uh, it signed an agreement to build Russia's new 5G network. And we know what the American view of Huawei is. President Trump has been going after this company. He doesn't want other countries, other allies, to be doing business with this company. How significant was that agreement for, with Russia to build its 5G network? And what, what was the message that it was sending to the rest of the world there? Well, I think if you uh, read the uh, letter issued by uh, the top leaders from Huawei yesterday, actually you'll find that both sides are very happy to enter into this strategic cooperation field. So that's their positioning. I think the message is quite clear because if you look at the history uh, of the emergence of, uh, of the emerging countries, actually, uh, this is a path that every emerging country has walked through because uh, previously most developing economies, they benefit mostly from a technological transfer, but then they need to have their own independent techno technological innovation so that the, uh, they have their own enterprises that working across the globe. Actually, uh, now you can see the scenario is that Huawei has been uh, meeting these um, limitations from uh, the United States in the name of the security worries. But I do think that Huawei uh, serving as one of the most excellent examples in terms of technological innovation by the Chinese companies is also having its own chance. So I do think that, that this um, uh, cooperation agreement is quite significant, and I do. Uh, Ambassador, both President Xi Jinping and President Putin, they were very critical of the United States during these meetings in Russia. Uh, let's listen to uh, what these leaders had to say, and uh, this is President Putin first. It is how the United States, I regret to say that, acts today. It extends their jurisdiction across the whole world. By the way, I already spoke about it 12 years ago. This model not only contradicts the normal logic of communication between the nations in the reality of the complex multipolar world. Most importantly, it does not meet the challenges of the future. It's hard to imagine a complete break of the United States from China or of China from the United States. We are not interested in this, and our American partners are not interested in this either. President Trump is my friend, and I am convinced he is also not interested in this. So what do you make of their statements, uh, Ambassador? Of course, President Xi Jinping was being a little bit more conciliatory there in his comments. The statements were sharply different. Uh, again. It shows that Russia's motivation is political and security, so it was all out attack on the United States, whereas President Xi was much more focused on the economic dimension, the interaction that he, he talked about. Uh, so for the two countries, this is a good illustration that their interests are really different. While they have a certain marriage of convenience or an entente, as Dmitry Trenin calls it uh, at present, uh, their interests are quite different. For example, China's ties with the United States, economic ties, uh, are really substantial, a trillion dollars in, in trade per year. So China has a lot to protect. From Russia's standpoint, uh, they are uh, security organs, personnel are dominating the Kremlin. So they don't seem to be taking economic factors into account. Everything seems to be an all-out attack, whether it's on Ukraine, election interference, Skripal poisoning, or, or other things. Alexander, you agree with that assessment? Well, uh, I, I don't agree with this assessment simply because all the points are mentioned, um, you know, the Ukraine and Skripal and so on. This has nothing to do with the current situation. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, the problem is that the West has been misbehaving all this century. Let's not forget what happened in Iraq, in Libya, in, uh, you know, all over the place. And up to a point, Russia was actually tolerating all of that, because even with Libya, uh, you know, Russia didn't really act uh, decisively. Uh, only in Syria that it had to do something because the West was completely out of control, having created ISIS itself and then starting to fight with it. So right. this, this came to a, a, a situation when Russia is forced, forced to, to, to deal with these security matters. And I think China understands that as well, because China did support Russia on many points about Syria and about other, other crisis points. Yeah. So you, you must understand something. The West has to change its behavior. It has to stop threatening other countries. It has to stop, even as we t speak, uh, Trump is, 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 is basically threatening to invade Iran. What is this? How can this be in the 21st century? It is very difficult to deal with the West when the West just simply doesn't want to see what it does itself. It, it simply refuses to accept its huge failures, its huge mistakes, and of course the aggression. Right. You know, we talk about Ukraine. Ukraine was attacked by the West. It was taken over by the West. <coughs> and then we are accused, uh, uh, Russia, you see, of, uh, 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 of taking over Crimea. It, it's, 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 it's absurd yep. what we're talking about. Not to mention, of course, the poisoning in Britain, uh -huh. which is now becoming a serious problem for, for Britain to explain itself what really happened. Right. Federica, we hear those, the very sharp differences uh, between Russia and the West. Um, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, he was on the same panel with President Xi Jinping and uh, President Putin at the International Economic Forum, which took place in St. Petersburg. And he warned that the world risks, quote, sleepwalking into a new Cold War. Let's watch. And the world has stumbled into a Cold War. And we all know what a Cold War means. I think our duty is to avoid the world to fall into another Cold War. And another Cold War of two blocks that probably will then be completely separated in a monetary, in a military, but also in a trade and technology perspective. This would be extremely dangerous for us all, and we need to do everything to avoid it. So, Federica, does Secretary Guterres have a point there? Uh, I think it, it, there is a point. I mean, there is a risk of, in my opinion, more of a Cold War of the real war, mm -hmm. especially if Trump insists on in going into Iran. Yeah. And, and this is going to be the end of, the end of everything. Um, Russians see themselves as Europeans, mm -hmm. all right? Their, their history is linked to the European history. And, uh, and they are in this situation because they have no alternative in this point. And, uh, and there are lots of contradictions in the foreign policy of the Western countries in this moment because, for instance, we are talking about Ukraine, but you know, nobody's talking and saying anything about what is happening in Yemen, which is led by our good allies, the Saudi. So there are lots of contradictions. And, and it's, it's like when, when people are fighting and nobody wants to stop, and, and this is becoming worse and worse and worse. So, so more than the Cold War, we really risk at a certain point that something will go south and have a real war. A and, hot war. And, yeah, yeah, and where we end with that, I don't know. Let me offer a more optimistic perspective. Right. Uh, it's useful to take into account the, the dimensions of the tensions, if you will. Trade wars don't tend to last a long time, particularly a, a negotiation you know, tends to solve, uh, uh, solve itself fairly soon, within a matter of months, not years, for example. So U.S.-Chinese tensions are likely to abate considerably once a trade agreement is reached. Whereas with Russia, the problem may be longer term because of Russia's occupation of part of Ukraine and to the extent it continues to carry out election interference and cyber attacks and things like that. Uh, U.S. and India are working closely together. Uh, there's a new U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy that was just unveiled uh, recently at the Shangri-La uh, Dialogue. So we're not talking about a Cold War with two great blocks. We're talking about a much more diverse set of relationships uh, around the world. 
and not one uh, that necessarily has the military confrontational aspect that the Cold War did. Right. Chen Chen, there was, uh, there was an interesting quote which I found in Forbes magazine, the United States Business Magazine, a very influential magazine. It was commenting on the growing relationship between China and Russia, and it said, and I'm quoting here, don't be fooled, it's all a show for the Western world. Russia can never make up for what the United States and Europe do for China, not today, not next year, not in five years, probably not in 10. What do you make of that? Is that Western hubris or something else? Uh, well, uh, I do think that uh, what's, what, what brings China and Russia closer is that they do, uh, both of them actually have the requirements of grasp more power in terms of the uh, uh, rule adjustments in in international institutions. So I do think that both uh, uh, countries are actually working very proactively. So I do think uh, uh, the current agreement between China and Russia to lift their partnership uh, into comprehensive uh, partnership of coordination will also boost their role in uh, further cooperation in institutions like the upcoming G20 and also uh, uh, the other institutions like BRICS uh, and other multilateral mechanisms. So I do think that's the uh, common uh, things that the both sides have. But with that said, I also think both sides are quite cautionary when uh, they are facing the rhetoric that probably they are having this new alliance. Just now, uh, we talk about the um, uh, one guest mentioned the Shangri-La Dialogue. Actually, I myself just returned from the Shangri-La Dialogue. I do think that if you look at the international institutions, uh, the traditional powers, especially the United States, it is still uh, trying to maintain its uh, 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 supremacy, uh, supremacy in terms of these international institutions that has been founded by itself since uh, the end of the Second World War. Right. So it has been uh, working inefficiently to meeting up the emerging countries' requirements. So how China and Russia should do, I think that's quite clear, uh, okay. and I do. Federica? I also think that we forget that despite, uh, the, the, despite the rhetoric, there is still a lot of work together with, with Russians, both the EU and the US. I mean, space station is, a first, is the most visible thing that comes right. to your mind, but there is common work in lots of areas, in lots of areas of the world, in lots of thematic areas. So the, it's, it's less dramatic, the relationship, than the rhetoric would, would say. And also, it's, you know, the tension with Russia is something that it's deep into the memory of the Americans, so it's an easy, it's an easy uh, enemy to sell and to interiorize because mm -hmm. it's part of of you know Hollywood to begin with. It's part of the last Cold War. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but it lasted so long that yeah. people and has interiorized this idea. Alexander, I just want to get your view on this before we uh, close the show, and that is, do you fear that there could be another Cold War? Well, to be honest with you, I think there is a Cold War already because imagine the NATO troops on the border with Russia. Uh, th this was unheard of in the Cold War. And uh, the situation around Russia uh, at the moment is so unstable and dangerous. And let's not forget that uh, we were on the verge of a nuclear war when uh, events in, in Ukraine got out of control and Russia had to put its nuclear forces on top alert because I think the West have lost its mind completely when they moved into Ukraine. This was something, this was the delicate balance that existed in Europe, and they destroyed it. I don't really see how it's going to shape up now. I think yeah. this is a Cold War already. But let me say another thing. Together, one is one entity. Russia and China have more yeah. consumers than America and the EU taken together. Yeah. Together, they present a powerful force because Russia has all the mineral resources yeah. and China has the most powerful manufacturing base in the world. So think about it. Yeah. If they start to get together, really, they would be a force bigger than both America and the EU. Okay. So I, I think the Americans and the Europeans better, better remember this. Ambassador, very quickly, uh, if we look at Russia and China, they've also uh, supported each other on some key international issues, like Venezuela, like the Iran nuclear deal. Um, has the whole I idea of international consensus, has that been undermined? Uh, there are some areas of cooperation and difference. So, for example, yeah. both China and Russia have played generally positive roles 
in dealing with the North Korea right. nuclear uh, situation. Uh, with regard to the Iran nuclear deal, both, as you correctly said, both China and Russia are supportive. Unfortunately, the U.S. has pulled out of, uh, of that deal. Yeah. Uh, with regard to Venezuela, both China and Russia have a lot of debt in Venezuela, but they've approached it two different ways. China's been quiet, and it's reached out to the Guaido, the opposition. Right. Uh, Russia's been louder, if you will, uh, four square behind Maduro, okay. but the IMF predicts 10 million percent inflation under the Maduro regime. It's not going to last. Okay, we are going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat, but before we go, a reminder to check out our podcast. You can listen through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. So give us a listen.